Well, uh, it's a tired uh, building down near the depot on West Washington Street that has about 30 men and maybe 15 women and children. And then uh, when we move up there, it it's just a, a small and a big farmhouse side by side. And we lived in the small farmhouse and the men in the alcohol recovery program lived in the big farmhouse. But that's all there was to it. Welcome to Miracles from the Hill podcast, where we share raw stories that display the anatomy of God's grace here at Miracle Hill Ministries. If this is your first time joining us, please subscribe. And of course, you can like, comment, and leave a review. To connect with us, visit our website linked in the description box. And now, here is our host, Ryan Dirk. Hello, listeners and viewers. Welcome to the Miracles from the Hill podcast. This is a special episode for us. We have uh, Reverend Dr. Reed Lehman, my friend and mentor, uh, whom if you guys know anything about Miracle Hill, you'll know a lot about him. So we're going to we're going to try to dig into parts of Reed's life and story that you haven't read in a book um, and and see what makes the man tick. So good morning, Reed. Morning, Ryan. And when I came on, one of my first jobs was to get rid of the doctor and the reverend and just invite everyone to call me Reed. So you just mess that up. I apologize. We'll just call you Reed. Uh, so if nobody's ever met you before and you're meeting them on like an airplane, introduce yourself in two sentences. I had the opportunity to lead a ministry uh, in Greenville for 32 years. And now I'm Johnny Appleseed planning similar ministries across the Southeast. Wonderful, wonderful. So we're going to dig into your story. And um, these are not just because you're here today. These, these actually sit here when we're filming and recording the podcast. So this is Reed's first book called God Wears His Own Watch. Uh, and it's kind of about the history of Miracle Hill and, and part of his story. But we want to start all the way back at the very beginning. Yeah. How in the world did the Laymans wind up in the upstate of South Carolina uh, involved with Miracle Hill? Well, my father thought he was supposed to be a missionary farmer in New Guinea. And he came to Greenville to train for the ministry. And he started working part-time at Miracle Hill while he was uh, in school and then never left. So... Uh, he, had, he got to do some farming along the way because he had a bunch of cows that uh, belonged to Miracle Hill, but he took care of, and it was like golf or tennis would be to you or me. Okay, and so he was, that was his job, was to help with the, the farm up in Pickens? His earliest job was to uh, create a farm to do addiction recovery for male alcoholics up at Pickens, where the Children's Home Foster Care Campus is today. And so he moved my mother and I and my younger sister uh, up there to do that. And um, it it was the most primitive of primitive conditions. And so how old is everybody? And what year is this we're talking about? This is 1957. I'm almost four. My sister is two. And um, when you swept the floor in the house, you didn't have to use a dustpan because all the dust fell through to the chickens underneath. Okay. Uh, so you you don't remember anything prior to Miracle Hill, I'm assuming? I have a tiny a tiny memory of uh, living in a trailer park in Greenville for a brief period of time. But otherwise, no, all of my memories start with Miracle Hill. And so when did it shift from this was a job to prepare him for New Guinea to this was his call? Well, he would have graduated in 58 or 59, and by then I think it was clear that this was his call. Dad responded to need, and um, the needs were so overwhelming, I think he probably never considered doing anything else after he got got his feet wet. So growing up, did you know where you were, or or was it just home? Like, did you, did you have an idea that you were at this ministry location, um, or was it just you were, you were at home, that was just life? 
and I, that was just life. I was just at home, and everybody was equally completely impoverished, and everybody had all their needs met. <laughs> <laughs> very George Mueller esque. Yeah, very George Mueller esque. Uh, we, I mean, you know, I was part of prayer times when we would pray for food, and they would show up while we were praying, and 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 then Dad and, and uh, the, the director then were very faithful to re- remind us, you know, of God's provision. But it was just a, such an amazing community because everybody there was completely sold out to do whatever God wanted with no regard to whether they ever got paid or not. And sometimes they went for weeks with no pay at all. But they had a, a roof over their head and They had food, a place to bellies. stay and they could go to the dining room to eat. And um, it, it, they would sometimes be short of money for the doctor, but we had a a kind doctor in Pickens that would take care of the children at the children's home and the staff that served there at no cost. So, uh, you know, if anybody's listening to this and they're familiar with Miracle Hill, they're, you know, they're familiar with this big giant organization, uh, this huge ministry stretched across counties. In 58, 59, you're a little tiny kid. What's Miracle Hill? What does it look like? How big is it? Well, uh, it's a tired uh, building down near the depot on West Washington Street that has about 30 men and maybe 15 women and children. And then uh, when we move up there, it's it just a, a small and a big farmhouse side by side. And we lived in the small farmhouse and the men in the alcohol recovery program lived in the big farmhouse. But that's all there was to it. So there was at that point, there's no children up on the hill. No, there were there were some children living in the rescue mission, um, uh, sort of the genesis of what would become Miracle Hill. But there's no children up there at all. Okay, so tell us again the story of how we wound up in children's ministry. Well, um, May Harlow, uh, who's now a retiree from Miracle Hill, was serving at Bob Jones, at a very reasonable position and reasonable salary. And uh, she volunteered on Sundays at the rescue mission. And one day she was, one Sunday afternoon, she was volunteering there. And she was the only staff person on duty. And the police brought some children they'd picked up in the street because there was nowhere to go with them. And she said, sure, we'll take them in. (laughs) And so that was how the children's home started. And they kept bringing more and more children to us. And uh, before long, I think we had 60 children in a house with two bathrooms just up the street from the rescue mission building. A house somebody was letting us use? I'm not sure if we were renting it or someone was letting us use it, but it was, it was n- not um, sterling structure at the time. I just want to repeat that, uh, for, especially for parents that are listening to this. It was a single-family home with two, bed, two bathrooms and 60 children. Yes. 60 children. And Miss May got, the, got us into this problem, uh, <laughs> but she, uh, she quit her job at Bob Jones and came to work at Miracle Hill, and for the first— number of months. She get, didn't get paid anything at all. She had her room and board, but she just served for free, making sure the children were taken care of. So how did the transition happen from that single family home on Washington Street up to Pickens? So um, soon uh, the older boys, the, the ones that have, the teenage boys had been thrown out of every school in the county were sent to live at where it was now the children's home. And uh, they, we converted a corn crib uh, to be a, a place for eight to ten boys to stay. And so the big boys were already there, and the, we just completely outgrew that home on Washington Street. And so uh, we felt like, and I say we, I mean, I was four. What did I know? <laughs> but they felt like uh, having uh, kids on, uh, uh, out in the country would be much healthier for them. And so they began building a, a building on the top of the hill that is, was later called Miracle Hall. Okay. And uh, for those of us that are ignorant, what is a corn crib? So a corn crib w- is like an 8 by 10 structure that has, um, that has slats around the outside of it so that the, corn doesn't, the ears of corn don't fall out on the ground. Uh, but there's no protection from the elements. There's a roof over the top, slats around the outside, and just years of corn sitting in there waiting to be fed to the animals. Okay, so uh, I'm, DSS would not be okay with this today. <laughs> <laughs> Likely not, but these boys that, we, that, that started up there were so troubled that nobody in, in, in 
state or city government want anything to do with them. So nobody looked too closely. Uh, they were just thrilled we were taking these boys off their hands. So you kind of grew up at the children's home as the children's home evolved into the children's home. Yes. Right. You get there and there's just a few, you know, men there and then and then some children get added and then and I'll let you, you know, walk through it, but eventually there's hundreds of children there. Yeah, at our peak there were more than 200 children on the campus there. And and a a school and a, a K through 12 school and uh, like a store. Uh, th- there was a uh, a little canteen. A canteen. Uh, yeah. Okay. So how did that it just kept on building and building? Yeah, uh, we just kept adding buildings, and um, when you think of it today, you know, with the buildings, we had too many kids for septic, so we built two big sewer ponds and, you know, miles of uh, clay pipe to transport the the waste and miles of water lines and, um, you know, acres of lawns. It, It just grew into something that nobody saw coming. Hmm. So talk about growing up there. What was that like? Well, it was the coolest place in the world to grow up. Uh, the, the school um, the school was always starting over because most of the kids who came to the school didn't have very good educational backgrounds. And I remember being in high school, and all the kids around me were saying, oh, I hope I pass that test. And to fit in, I was saying, oh, I hope I pass that test. But I'd had you know, 10 grades of good school already, and they hadn't had hardly anything. And uh, the teachers the teachers were so patient and so amazing and, and so sacrificial. But um, it, as I saw the people around me, I knew that that's the way I wanted to be when I grew up. I wanted to serve as they served, and I wanted to be, I wanted to have the kind of character that they had. So did you view yourself as being different from the children who grew up there? Well, I knew I had two parents who loved me, uh, but my best friends were kids who live living in the dorm, and uh, I, in most respects, except for you know going home to my the bedroom of my parents' house at night, we were all the same. So we'd get up. All the boys would get up in the morning and walk an hour for breakfast. Uh, not an hour, walk about a mile and a half for breakfast uh, to the main dining room, and then stay for school, and then have lunch in the dining room and then go do our, our work chores in the afternoon and go back to the dining room for supper and then, you know, head home for bed. So I wasn't part of the dorm activities at night, but everything else that was going on, I was part of part of the whole thing. I, uh, I do remember one early mistake I made. There was a uh, haystack that nobody was allowed to play on. Uh, but I, I wrote a note and signed my dad's name to it saying that I could play on the haystack. <laughs> And I gave it to the whoever was in charge of that, and he looked at the note and grinned <laughs> and said, okay, you can go play on the haystack. So I'm playing on the haystack, and nobody else is playing on the haystack. And then when the dad got home that night, he gave him that note. That was not a good night no, for me. That wasn't a good night. <laughs> Do you think, did, did you feel like the other kids treated you differently? I, I felt mostly accepted. Yeah, I, I, it, it was... It was pretty egalitarian, and you were respected or not, depending on what you brought to the table, not on who you were related to. And you were a farm boy doing the same stuff they were. Yeah, yeah. I was, um, in high school, I was not very socially adept, so I was sort of the nerd of the world till I was in the 11th grade, and then there were so few people in the 11th and 12th grade that I you know, became king of the hill, <laughs> even though I was still a nerd. <laughs> Uh, and you're different now, how? Oh, I'm just, I'm just, <laughs> Not much. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> but if you look at a picture of my wedding, my wife said the years have been very kind to me. <laughs> you are a very attractive older man, sir. Um, what, what do you feel like your parents and the people there taught you about ministry in those early days? I think they... They didn't, nobody knew what they were doing. Um, I, I, I say, I mean, they, they were reasonably well-trained as educators, but nobody knew anything about what a nonprofit should look like or how, how that should work and 
all the pieces of what it would do. They just knew there was this huge need and somebody had to meet it. And they were, they said, here am I, send me, I'll meet it. Um, and then ask your question again. Oh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> what, what were they teaching you about ministry as a whole? Oh yeah. Just, just that, you know, do what you can as well as you can sacrifice. Uh, money is no object. Sacrifice as much as you can. I think uh, one of the most profound impacts upon me came from a guy named Don Hummel, and I was at middle school in one of his classes, and he took us he took us to his house, his mobile home, to spend the night one night. Um, me and two or three other boys from from the same class, and um, we um, had popcorn and watched something on TV, and he taught us the importance of cleaning our toenails and having good books hygiene, but just accepted us and enjoyed our company. And that had a huge, profound impact on shaping me. I'm not sure he remembered it the following week, but he's always been one of my heroes. Do you still clean your toenails regularly? Yes. Okay. I still follow his advice. (laughs) (laughs) Now, all these kids that you grew up with, do you talk to any of them today? Yeah. I, uh, uh, it, it's good to see them at reunions and 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 stuff, but often we reach out uh, to one another and outside of reunions. And of course, uh, one of them I've been really close to for the last. Uh, we'll get to that. We'll get to <laughs> number that. of you. You do have one much closer relationship than others. So, um, tell us about the ditch in the in the bottom land. So, in between the two campuses of Miracle Oil Children's Home. Uh, th- there was a there's a bottom land the Illinois River runs between the campuses, and for a long time it was almost entirely a swamp. And we wanted to be able to use the the property for crops and and for making hay and stuff like that. And uh, draining a swamp is not an easy task. Uh, but someone told my father that you could do it with dynamite, so he bought a case of dynamite and he set me. Uh, in charge of cutting the pieces of dynamite and, and planting them in a row uh, about uh, 40% of a mile this way and about a uh, quarter mile that way. And so we planted planted them about three or four feet apart, and then we hooked up a blasting cap to one end, and we pushed down on the plunger, and it started, and it blew all the way down in a row and all the way over to the river, and the dirt flew in all directions, and so there was no, no dirt to get rid of later. And it was a beautiful, perfect ditch that drained the swamp within the next couple months. And so I think this is fascinating. Where where do you get dynamite back then? You bought it at the local hardware store. Local hardware store. Yeah, you just had to you had to sign your name for it. Sign your name. You had to take credit for yeah. it, but you could just go get as much dynamite as you needed. You at could. The time. And I and of course I, I didn't know you could cut dynamite, but you just take a sharp knife and. Cut it at whatever length you want it to cut, and then, you know, t- take a like a a real thin spade with a, a thin blade and stick it down and wiggle it back and forth and drop it in. I just feel like you're not supposed to cut dynamite. <laughs> that sounds extremely dangerous to well, me. Please don't hit it with a hammer. <laughs> please don't hit it with a hammer. Okay, so. Um, you, there, you know, there's one major difference between your youth and my youth. You know, I grew up not hearing a whole lot about Jesus. Um, you grew up hearing a tremendous amount about Jesus, right? So I, I, I'm assuming everything that you guys did was based in prayer and you were at, at church and chapel services. Mm-hmm. Um, when did that start shifting for you from being a story to being a, a relationship? And then when did you meet Jesus officially? Well, it, I mean, it just, it just in, uh, imbued everything that we did. It, it, it was part of everything. And as best I know, I accepted Christ as my Savior at age six. But then in later services, if you can't remember the day and the hour, you aren't really saved. So I would ask him, like, well, in case it wasn't right then, do it now. But I, I was committed to the Lord from the earliest stage. And... Um, and couldn't imagine not being committed to the Lord. I didn't really understand the alternatives and consider the alternatives till I was uh, about grown. Okay. So you you grew up 
with this very real sense that Jesus was not only guiding the the mission and um, and work of Miracle Hill, but your life as well. That was real to you. That was real to me, and and there was never I don't remember a time when I didn't believe that God answered prayer. That God was not just a, some God out in the universe, but that He actually listened to His people and did what they asked him to do. Do you remember like the, the one, you know, one of the early times when, when you guys prayed for something and, and it happened and you were just in awe at that? Yeah. I I remember being gathered with everybody else to the chapel and, uh, and praying for food because we were out of food. And, um, and while we were praying, uh, these trucks drove up outside with food people had collected in Georgia uh, to um, bring to Miracle Hill Children's Home, and they were going to bring it later, but they did, someone had a wild here they were supposed to bring it that very day. So now, when I gathered together with uh, the Hallfords and Miss May and Miss Fira, I guess there was some suspicion on the part of the other staff that that was staged a little bit. But Really? Yeah, by the person who's the director at the time and and maybe it was maybe it wasn't but I do know that there were many times when we prayed and for sure God answered and uh, whether that was staged or not it certainly built my faith and the faith of everybody with me so th- there were times when the cupboards were bare yeah and there's 200 children yeah well, well as far as Some I know I don't remember taking of... an inventory but but I do remember you know, we lived on whatever God provided, and so liver was dirt cheap, so we had lots of liver. Uh, we lived one summer on frog legs and another summer on rhubarb. <laughs> you had a good source for frog legs one summer. It, somebody gave us this uh, refrigerated truck full of frog legs, and we just ate whatever whatever was given at the time. So I started the summer with a very open mind, but I was done with them by the end of the summer. So uh, that continues to this day. So I, in my time, I remember um, several, you know, 100-pound boxes of ground emu coming in at one point, and we had emu burgers and emu spaghetti and emu tacos uh, for months. That's all we ate. Another time we had uh, this endless supply of what we called chili mac. It was just noodles and, and beef. And I think we ate that, ate that for about six months uh-huh. uh, for lunch and for dinner. We had it with peppers. We had it with cheese. We had it with hot sauce, anything you can think of to doctor it. So I'm sure it was the same with, with the frog legs. And uh, what was the first one that you said? Rhubarb. Rhubarb. Yeah. I, I still love rhubarb to this day. But, you know, that's not very common in South Carolina. I don't know how in the world a truckload of excess rhubarb got given away in South Carolina because nobody grows it and nobody eats it. Do you still eat liver? No, no, I gave it up. <laughs> and uh, uh, frog legs? No, nope. they're good. I, well, I, I know it, they're just like chicken, but I have no Go interest the in them anymore. <laughs> Get them. Um, Katie's sitting over there. Katie, do you eat frog legs? No, no. Okay. Katie's a negative on the frog legs as well. Um, okay, so uh, so you're growing up. You meet Jesus. You know Jesus. Um, uh, I, this is probably getting a little cerebral, but. Was was following Jesus in your mind completely connected to doing ministry, or were they were they kind of separate ideas? Like you have this relationship with Jesus where you walk with Him every day, and then as a result you do ministry, or were they intrinsically linked in your head? I, I think they must have been intrinsically linked in my head. I don't remember ever having um, ever thinking that this was separate pieces. And from my, you know, by the time I was 12 or 13, I think I envisioned myself serving in, not just serving in ministry to the poor, but serving at Miracle Hill. Uh, I think my father expected that of me, but I was a very willing conscript. Like, that's what I wanted to do. That's what I felt called to do. And when I got married, I made it real clear to my, my fiance that this is what, this is my calling and this is what we're going to do. Are you sure you're on board with that? All right, tell us about your fiance. So Barbara was this skinny girl that came to Miracle Hill in the ninth grade to live in the dorm there with the girls' dorm. And um, 
And she says that I dated her because I had to date all the new girls coming in. And uh, we, we dated for a while uh, when she was there. She was there in the the ninth and 10th. Let's see. She was there in the ninth grade through the 11th grade. And then she went was able to return to her family for her senior year in high school. Uh, so we dated and then we broke up and went our separate ways. And then... Um, after high school, she came back to work in the in the girls' dorm, and hmm. we began dating again, and that's when we got married. So what did dating look like at the children's home in the, I guess this is the 60s, right? Yeah. Well, it, um, so I was, I was a pretty good boy, except for dating. <laughs> so um, if you, if you, you got, we had a demerit system. So if you got in trouble, you had to work two hours for every demerit you got, and you got five demerits for holding hands, you got ten demerits for uh, oh. kissing, and then you got uh, additional demerits if you dated without a chaperone. And um, and my father, realizing that was really a weak spot in my part, uh, doubled the demerits. If I got any demerits relating to romance, he doubled them. So I could work as many as 40 hours for a single kiss. <laughs> And after a while, I finally decided it wasn't worth it anymore. Did you, how many kisses did it cost you? Uh, it uh, it probably cost me sixty to seventy hours or so. <laughs> before you learned your lesson. Uh, well, I, before I decided that I, well, I was now old enough that I could ride my little fifty cc uh, motorcycle to town and date when they went home for the family weekend. <laughs> Okay, so you 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 meet Barbara. Um, she comes back to work at the at the children's home. Um, which man, that's a whole story in itself that I'd love to hear from Barbara one day. Um, and so you guys resume your romance. Yeah, um, not right away, but she she was taking the the littlest girls, like four through seven, four through eight, to uh, Carowinds, and she asked, she needed an extra chaperone. She asked me to come along and. That was sort of when I, I was, until that point, I was trying to set her up with my best friend. And then I realized I didn't want to do that. I wanted to uh, see what was possible for me. And we'll, we'll probably talk more about that. But so today, how many years have you been married? 47 this year. 47 years. Praise the Lord. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, okay. So you, you finish high school and now it's time to go to college. Tell us about college. So, um, Miracle Hill was so strict back in those days that when I went to college, I went to Bob Jones University, which was within driving distance, and I could live at home and commute. Um, but some people know Bob Jones for its strictness. I felt like I'd been let out of a box. <laughs> <laughs> I experienced such freedom there, and uh, it was just amazing that uh, you you could do so many things and still be and not be sinning, still be in the will of God. Uh, wow. Uh, okay, so you went to school to study what? I didn't know. I, I knew I was supposed to go to school. I had no idea what to study. I started as a humanities major, which I thought was a clever choice, but everyone in my society laughed at me because they knew that I really didn't know what I was supposed to do. And uh, uh, first semester um, biology was so boring that I changed my major to business management because I wouldn't have to take a second semester of biology. And that was exactly the right major for me. So I got my degree in business management. So your dad didn't have an opinion? I mean, if, if the if, expectation was you come back to Miracle Hill. If he did, he didn't express it. Really? Yeah. He, I, 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 I think he had a strong expectation I would go to Bob Jones to go to school. But I, he didn't try to tell me what to take or not take. Okay, so you shifted to business management. Mm -hmm. uh, finished in four years, I'm taking it. Yeah. And then and then you're done? I thought I was. You, th you thought you were and you go back to you go back to the ministry? Yeah, yeah, I go back to the ministry and um I'd been working uh of course I've been working there since I was 9. I was fired from my first job as a 9-year-old cuz I was sort of lazy and fired from the greenhouse. But I've been working in uh landscaping and maintenance um through college, and I was over all the maintenance by the end of college, and then um, just continued doing that and doing special projects um, for the for the next year after I finished school, and then left. Okay, and why would you in the world would you leave? 
because I had um, I had been ch- taught that you, know, you want to be in the perfect will of God, and if you ever miss the perfect will of God, you'll always be sort of second rate. I don't think my dad taught me that. Maybe I'd, I don't know I had learned it along the way. But I realized I'd married the wrong woman because we were fighting over my work at Miracle Hill, and either either I was going to have to divorce her, which if I did, I couldn't work at Miracle Hill, or I was going to have to leave Miracle Hill to save my marriage. And I was so very puzzled that I had somehow married the wrong person, and now I probably was going to be out of God's will because one way or the other, I couldn't do what I thought he called me to do. But I gave my resignation and went to work for a lumber company in Florida. That must have been tough. I, and I told my father, we both wept. I, 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 I don't know what was going on in his mind, but I was just feeling like I'd let him down, I'd let God down, I'd made a horrible mistake, and I had no idea what was going to happen in my life after this. So in reflection, all these years later, what was the, what was the cause of the fighting? Was it, was it you working too much? Um, I think God brought the fighting to us to get me out of there. There's nothing that... I, I, I had been in a closed Christian environment all of my life, and I knew nothing or very little about the outside world. And if I was going to be an effective leader at Miracle Hill, I really needed to understand the world much more than I did, and I, there's not any chance I would have left. So God brought conflict between us. Now, we were living in a fishbowl. We were living you know, right in the middle of campus, and everybody was looking at Barbara, to, or at least she felt, to see if she was living up to their expectations of the daughter-in-law of the president and the, you know, the wife of I think they like me. I hope they like me. But uh, <laughs> so she felt like she was in a fishbowl. I was a workaholic because that dad had taught me that well. Uh, I was a people pleaser. And uh, so she was not re- very important in my eyes, at least as she saw herself. Um, but I think God just brought the conflict between us to get us both out of there and, and have us build our marriage on a foundation without, without the trappings of ministry. Hmm. So uh, you, you moved to Florida. And you're there for some years. What what was that time like? Um, it was a lot of fun. Uh, I worked for the lumber company in uh, 84 Lumber in Miami, and then they brought me to Orlando as an assistant manager, and then they brought me to Greenville as a manager, which I never expected that. Um, but I had I just closed that door on my life, and I was very successful and active in church, and we were starting our family, and um, then out of a blue about four years after I left, Barbara said to me one day, I think we're needed back at Miracle Hill. Would you ever consider going back? And it just completely blew me away because I closed that door and locked it. Before we get past that, I'd just like to uh, imagine for a moment Reed Lehman on South Beach in Miami. <laughs> you, that was that was your experience. You lived in Miami. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, okay. So Barbara was, Barbara heard the call. You didn't hear it. I didn't hear it. I, I, I was determined not to hear it because I, I I realized that, you know, I was always going to be second rate. So, so she suggests that you go talk to your dad. Yeah. And was that a quick transition back? Uh, I, I was really cautious at first because I was I, I was afraid it might be a whim that she would have, and then she would say, oh, never mind, or something. So we carefully thought about it and prayed about it for about a month until we both felt comfortable with the call. Dad was having some physical problems then. He was also, he didn't really have a good um, key second leaders there in the organization with him. So there was clearly a need. And um, and after after we both felt comfortable with the call, then I went to see him and offered my services to come back, which he was glad to accept. And then I gave about a three month notice to the lumber company because uh, I got my year end bonuses out of the way, and then uh, <laughs> came back in January first. So, other than kind of the experience of the world. What do you think you learned at the lumber company that you couldn't have learned in the fishbowl? So over the years, Miracle Hill had had paid for a long time nothing at all and then very little to its staff. 
and staff who um, who were quite capable would sometimes come and work sacrificially for a while and leave, and staff who weren't very capable would co- would often come and stay. And even though people were working sacrificially, there was not um, a high focus on quality and a high focus on accomplishment among many of the staff. And I went out to the outside world and realized how much the outside world was demanding of all of its workers for nothing more than a paycheck. And I thought, you know, why wouldn't Christians want to demand the same thing, the same kind of excellence of themselves back in, back in the office at Miracle Hill? And so I, I think I brought back an expectation of performance that I wouldn't have had when I left. I also brought back uh, an understanding of how Miracle Hill fit in or didn't fit in with the rest of the world. And Miracle Hill had been segregated for all of those years. Um, they had tried to do a, a separate uh, rescue mission for um, uh, African Americans on a street about a mile away from the mission. It hadn't done any done well. And when I came back, I was horrified that we were segregated. And when I left, that was just normal life. Uh, nobody thought it was a problem. And so I think that I'm the only one who could have integrated Miracle Hill because everyone else that was there would have said to a new person coming in, well, that won't work here. You don't understand. But I, I did understand because I've lived in that environment, mm-hmm. and I now knew— it was it was wrong for us, and we needed to make a change. And we, and I said about making the change. Hmm. So we've got a lot of story left, and I really want to dig into um, conversation about leadership and what you've learned about leadership over the years. But we're about forty minutes in, mm-hmm. so I think I want to ask you one more question, and then we'll we'll kind of end this segment, and then we'll uh, uh, our our patient listeners will wait for the next episode to listen so they can, they can check out what you have to say more. So I want to go back to the moment that you decided to leave Miracle Hill. And, um, on one hand, you, you knew that God had called you to your marriage. On the other hand, you knew that God had called you to Miracle Hill. How did you separate those two ideas and decide to leave? If I could have divorced my wife and stayed at Miracle Hill, I, w- I would have divorced my wife. Hmm. And I don't think it would hurt her feelings hearing it because she knows it. You know, and she didn't then. I mean, I, I, I don't think I was so crude as to tell her that. But, but I was determined to fulfill God's call. And when I realized that was impossible, because either I would divorce her or she would divorce me, but in either case, I wouldn't qualify, then I just thought I've just got to make the best of it. And and by God's grace, as I drove away, as I drove to Miami, I determined I would not get bitter against her, that, that if, if that door was closed, I was just going to be the best husband I could be and make the best of it that I possibly could. And our marriage solidified really quickly, and we became, you know, we began to trust each other, and we began to listen to each other, and, hmm. and we began to form our own spiritual identity as a family. So you went from the fishbowl of Miracle Hill to the, the fishbowl that God kind of intended for you and your bride to, to walk through life together. Yeah. Um, and Miami of 1976 was a complete different setting than the fishbowl of Miracle Hill. Yeah, I imagine it was, uh, it was very different. Yeah. Um, okay, well, thank you, thank you, thank you for sharing this kind of first part of your story. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to pray for our listeners and then we will sign off and sign back on here in just a minute. So let's pray. Lord, we love you. We thank you for today. Father, I, um, I know that each person that's listening and, um, and or watching this thing that they've got their own decisions that they're trying to make, um, about what's right for their life or how to follow you. Um, Lord, I, I pray that you just help them to quiet their heads and quiet even their hearts, Lord, so that they can just listen to you, that they would be so in tune with what you would have them to do, that your voice uh, would be louder than the, the, um, you know, the white noise of the world. We love you. We trust you. We thank you for today. We ask that you guide us as we go on. Um, you may help us to be a little bit more like Jesus today than we were yesterday. In Jesus' name, amen. Say goodbye, Reed.